So welcome. My name is Ayala Fader. I'm professor of anthropology here at Fordham Lincoln Center in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and affiliated with Jewish Studies. Um, before we begin tonight's program, I'd like to make just two Jewish Studies announcements. Tuesday, October 8th at 4 p.m., a new exhibit is opening, Fordham's Babel, an exploration of world languages in the special collections, which is uptown at the Rose Hill campus. You can find out more information online on the Jewish Studies website. And then um, the programming for Jewish Studies will resume after the holidays. And our first event is going to be October 28th at 6 p.m. Joy Layden's book launch um, is at 6. Did I say that? Yes. Um, and the title is What We Make of Who We Are, Jewish, Trans, and Family Identities. And that'll be in this building on the fourth floor. We hope to see you all there. Um, so it's my great pleasure to welcome back Professor Jessica Roda to Fordham and to celebrate the publication of her book, For Women and Girls Only, Reshaping Jewish Orthodoxy Through the Arts in the Digital World, which just came out last spring. Um, this is an unusual book about ultra-Orthodox Haredi women artists, both inside and outside of their communities, who are expressing themselves in digital spaces and provoking social change in all kinds of unexpected ways, which we'll hear about tonight. Um, and I'll introduce Jessica very briefly right now. Professor, Professor Jessica Rhoda is an anthropologist and an ethnomusicologist and is herself a musician and dancer. She's currently assistant professor of Jewish civilization at Georgetown's Walsh School of Foreign Service. And for Women and Girls Only is her second book. Her first book is in French, for those who speak French, and it's about Sephardic music and politics in France. Let me just say that I first met um, I first met uh, Jessica, or Professor Rhoda, we'll call her Jessica, when she was awarded a postdoctoral research fellowship at Fordham Seminar for Jewish Orthodoxy. I know. <laughs> which was an interdisciplinary social science group of scholars in Jewish studies. Cool to follow her work as it's developed and to get to know her as a colleague and a friend. So tonight's book launch is a little bit unusual. So I'm going to give you the order of events so you know what's going on. The first part of this evening will be a discussion about Jessica's book um, and my longtime friend and colleague, Omri Alicia, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Queens College and the Graduate Center at CUNY is going to join me at talking to Jessica. Omri is also the author of an excellent book, Moral Ambition, Mobilization and Social Outreach in Evangelical Megachurches. So he brings a comparative wider lens to our discussion, that of the anthropology of religion. We're thrilled to have him. And I'm joining the conversation as well because I've written on ultra-Orthodox Jews in New York. Uh, I have two books. One is Mitzvah Girls, Bringing Up the Next Generation of Hasidic Girls in Brooklyn and Hidden Heretics, more recently Jewish Doubt in the Digital Age, which has all kinds of interesting parallels with Jessica's work. So after that portion of the conversation, Jessica will read a short selection from her book and um, NYU Press is offering a 30% discount, which I hope will entice you to buy it. And then Jessica will take on the MC role and introduce our two performers for this evening to give you a sense of the exciting artistic expressions that Jessica writes so eloquently about. We're really excited to welcome artist Malky Goldman. You want to raise your hand? Uh, and Ricky Rose. <laughs> um, you can see this won't be a, a boring, dry academic event. So finally, there is a light dinner um, after this event, or you can help yourself right now, and I hope you'll join us and continue to informally chat with everybody. So let's begin. So Omri and I will take turns. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to begin. Um, you know, in a lot of popular media, ultra orthodox women seem to be faced with two stark choices: either they can express themselves, or they have to leave. Right. But Jessica, you write about such an interesting, different, and much more complicated situation with the Haredi artists that you write about: the private performers, the influencers, uh, the public artists, the celebrities. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about your findings and also how you studied this group. Yes. First of all, I would like to thank um, Ayala Feder 
Omri as well, uh, to be here to invite me. It's a great pleasure to celebrate this book here and also with those two amazing artists uh, that I'm writing about in the book. Um, so the findings, and, and maybe a, just a small uh, element because um, who I am also to write this book, I think it's a, um, an important uh, part, I would say, of uh, understanding this, tra this trajectory. So this trajectory is, is a lot about understanding the in-between, the in-between worlds. Uh, I myself, I'm, uh, I grew up in French Guiana. I grew up in a very secular environment, and I reconnect with my Jewishness very late, um, I mean, very late, I was 17 when I moved to France. So I'm coming from this angle of a Jewish liberal um, feminist also space. And I'm myself an artist. And um, when I started to look at the Haredi world, because I was very interested in this universe that was very different than what my family did that assimilated, um, I really thought that um, I started actually working with people who left and progressively um, people who left, I started to meet also people who were in between and then also to have access to the inside and the world of a lot of a lot of women artists. And all the chapters in the book um, are really trying to encapsulate the fluidity and the contact that you have in between all those different worlds that actually you also in your in your in your so that's kind of a dialogue with your own book hidden heretics um, that talks about this complexity of being in being out and the lens of the art is um, also you know by nature the idea of being marginal right especially in the the tension between be, being religious um, especially as a woman and or living as well. And on the other hand, being an artist. So this interesting tension. Um, and I would say that in terms uh, uh, yeah, of, of um, so the question was uh, the big that method too, so like what you did. What I did, yes. So I studied it in Montreal. Uh, I did a lot of uh, say collaborative work. I myself taught piano to some of the, the, the amazing girls uh, in Montreal. Then I also taught for about a year or so anthropology. Uh, to a group of women in Montreal, um, and it was a back and forth between those two cities, Montreal and New York, and to look at the connection between spaces. So the idea of in between, um, and and I talk in the book about what uh, translocal ethnography, um, and thinking also how we look at the Haredi world and trying to expand also on the on the locality and to think about it in terms of the connections. And the art is a great uh, tool to, to think about those connections, um, I would say. I'm gonna stop yeah. here. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. And, and it's really important that you've done that because so much of Haredi, social science Haredi literature is sort of framing the Haredi communities in either neighborhoods or enclaves. And your work explodes that in yeah. all kinds of interesting ways. Okay, Omri. Um, yeah. Great, yeah, I want to uh, first thank both of you for inviting me to be part of this conversation um, and for allowing me to take the opportunity to read this fantastic book. I'll give a plug for it myself. It is really an excellent book. Um, I had a few awkward moments because I, I, I read on the train and sitting on the F train with a book called For Women and Girlfriends. <laughs> well, I had a few moments of um, strange looks and things like that, but I push through it and it's really a, a beautifully written and smart book um you know one of those rare academic books that's both a page turner and and very sophisticated and very smart and illuminating uh, and so i think one of the things that we're going to do now is ask some questions that go deeper into the ethnography and then then we'll sort of pan out and ask some big picture bigger picture questions um and so i wanted to ask about and, and you mentioned throughout the book and in one of the early chapters that um, you, you describe the from female artists, as you call them, describe them as existing on the fringes of society, both in, in the larger sense and in the, the, their own orthodox communities, very much on the margins, um, in the sense that they're recognized for their talents, but they're viewed differently from other women in more conventional roles as leaders and decision makers in the community. And yet you argue at the same time that these from female artists have a bigger impact in Orthodox communities than one might expect. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so first of all, the, the term from female artists, this is their term. Um, they, 
you know, especially the in the chapter, the celebrity, a lot of them who are on social media and who exploded also during COVID and who are on YouTube. Um, so in terms of their, um, the, the idea of, um, can you repeat the, the, the fringes, the fringes that they are in the fringes and the concepts. So a lot of the time, you know, when I talk about my work, most of people are saying, yeah, this is how many have women who are, you know, celebrities or how many are, I mean, there's always this, especially as anthropologists, as, as you both yes. know, there's always the, the quantity. And I, I always respond, indeed, the chapter on the celebrities, you don't have that many. You don't have that many Braha Shafa, they were, you know, Schwartz and, you know, a lot of other women who are still inside and the same with the artists who left, you know, we have Malky and Vicky here. Um, you don't have that many. But the consumption, uh, when you know the number of views and the impact that they also have in the industry and to change the perspective also within the community. And what was fascinating is that, for instance, in Montreal, um, so during COVID, I was there you know, in, in Outremont, I lived in Outremont, and uh, there was a lot of discussion about the different types of the DVD, the most, you know, satmar who are not supposed to, you know, to, you know, consume some of the DVDs, but you have the technology lady in Montreal and she has all those, those material and the number of girls who read, you know, not in school that you can heard about it and some of them will consume. So the impact that they have in terms of the consumption, some of the YouTube video, they have over 500,000 views on, on YouTube. Um, so that's, that's a, a huge, uh, a huge amount. And I also make the parallel with the secular industry, you don't have that many celebrities anywhere, but their impact in general, in terms, if you think about, I'm teaching a class now on music and gender, and I really look at masculinity, for instance, and, and performance and pop star, you don't have that many, but for instance, you know, who make revolution in terms of gender identity and performance, but the impact on the general audience to be able to open a book or an idea about making possibility for the one who wants to go there. So that's my kind of my response about marginality that we should also potentially look at the center. Yeah. But to evaluate the real, you know, um, real impact, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Which I think is true for a lot of us who do any kind of ethnography where our quote unquote sample sizes are, are often very small. <laughs> Um, but in an age of social media and of digital expression, digital performances of all kind, you know, the, 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 the ripples that are created by these tiny samples of people can be actually quite, yeah. quite large. And ethnography, especially digital ethnography, can actually track some of those. Like, yes. you know how many likes. You can yes. count them. And you can see who's following whom and exactly. that works. And, yeah. and also in face-to-face -face kinds of ethnographies, you're asking people and they're telling you. And... Yeah, the ripples are really fascinating to trace. And just to add on the, the digital and to see the impact of the digital on the real life, it was fascinating during COVID group of women who never met, for instance, you know, they only had online concert and then they decided to meet, oh, and it, it, commenting on social media. Mm -hmm. So the, the continuity between the digital and, uh, and I also had a lot of connection through the, the digital at first. Yeah, I, I think anthropologists have no choice but to, fall in right and that's how it is now um okay so in the book you distinguish between the informal and the formal market which is really fascinating can you tell us a little bit about that um and also about room women's competition with the male kosher music industry which perhaps not all of you knew existed but does uh, so yeah both. so i'm going to start with the, little, yeah. the last part it's super um, which you know, when you talk about Orthodox Jewish music, um, or kosher music industry, it's essentially male, right? There is this 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 knowledge, uh, you know, women, and also part of uh, making fun of women's performances, right? <laughs> so how you know the the way they they perform, the way they sing. Um, and actually, some, some comments like, "Oh, this is out of tune," or there is there is some some a lot of um, you know knocking a little bit on 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 women's perspective and and performance. So, the sphere of in the chapter that I call the celebrity is the women who were trained um, sometimes with bateshuva with women who 
you know, who were coming from the outside and who became religious, but also sometimes with professional um, musicians and, and singers and taking a lesson and then integrating it. And the idea in, in many cases and the interaction that I had, and even on social media as well, it was the idea of we can provide the same type of entertainment for women and we should also provide as quality, you know, that you can find in the, film, in the male industry. And in so the discussion about how much they will, you know, the fees, for instance, the difference in some of them arguing and fighting to say, no, I'm not going to go on this camp, you know, if they're not going to pay me that amount of money, because they will do that for a male performer. Why would they, you know, even if the audience is, you know, different when you go to a male camp. So, and this, this interesting um, tension here among artists, uh, and especially not tension, but this we're going to provide. Also, this desire to be recognized by some of the male artists. So what is interesting is that who is following whom, yeah. what they're commenting, you know, and especially some of the women, oh, you know, commenting on male performer. And in certain interaction, you can see that, you know, there's a sense of proud that when a famous male artist is commenting on a, on a or just make a comment, it's something that is valuable. And then you have the private, uh, so that's the celebrity that is on social media. And the private sphere is the more secluded one that you will never see on social media. So this is uh, where I work with a, with a school in Montreal, in Kyrs Joel as well, with a group of a band um, using uh, women there that had access to uh, their beautiful music. And the interesting also correlation between both and you can see that indeed they, they belong to specific communities, um, which you know it's it's pretty clear the space um, according to where you you belong. But you also see the overlap and the connection between both of the informal market. And the fascinating for me for with the informal market is to see how it circulates. So, for instance, with the technology lady, the fact that you have a play from London that is arriving to Montreal or one from Monsi arriving that is in English arriving in Montreal translated into Yiddish and having the recording from a woman in Tosh uh, a part of the recording and the rest is in and this very vibrant you know um creativity yeah I'm gonna stop here yes <laughs> you are very disciplined um that reminds me of the work I did a long time ago where um, girls were encouraged to speak more Yiddish at home by their teachers and their brothers all made fun of their Yiddish and mocked them and said they had an English accent and Yiddish they didn't have a real Yiddish. It's very similar. Actually, there's interesting comments uh, when girls in Moore Park, for instance, sometimes they record, I remember there was a hotline when the song was circulating and I brought it to some of the girls in Montreal and they were making fun of the the, the Yiddish accent in Boer Park is like, what is that? You know? <laughs> that might be a human universal. Yes, I think New Yorkers needs to come, you know, do more field work I, in Montreal. I think that's true. And again, like that you have created this model for doing that, you mm -hmm. know, the circulation. Uh, Omri, I think it's you, right? Yeah, so I want to uh, build on this, but also ask kind of big picture questions, specifically on the theme of, of religion and religiosity in the arts. There's a a sentence that I like from early on in the book where you say, from female art worlds encapsulate the contradictions between the need for privacy of ultra-Orthodox women and the publicity of the arts. And this hits on a theme that has always fascinated me, which is what I sort of call the troubled relationship between religiosity and the arts. And, and I, I call it troubled not because it's a bad relationship, right, but because it's a relationship that always brings with it certain tensions and restrictions um it's a relationship that's just natural, right that like worship and expression and you know praise and piety go together with the arts and yet there are always limitations restrictions that need to be accommodated tensions that arise um i found this in my own work with uh, pentecostal uh, uh, worship dancers in new york who are constantly struggling to redefine the act of performance as something else as a, for them it was calling it a ministry and that was a way of trying to make it seem less sinful less uh, distracting less indulgent um, so there are all kinds of ways in which that relationship becomes a challenge something that has to be mediated negotiated and so i'm just curious how do you see your work 
shedding light on broader issues concerning religiosity in the arts, um, not only within the confines of <laughs> Jewish practice, but uh, in, in, in wider terms. Yes, yeah, so that, that was the, you know, the, the big the big question, and I I, um, I think that in this case, this is really what I'm trying to in in the first chapter when I talk about creativity, um, this possibility to expand, um, especially when coming from a liberal you know liberal art point of view of looking at the arts, and looking at the arts as this this place where you have restriction everywhere you have norms you know when any kind of movement, artistic movement, uh, tries to develop, there is always a kind of a norm and a system that is there. And I think that actually, if we start to look at religion also, and not question of belief, which is interesting, I almost didn't talk about question of belief um, through the, the ethnography, but to look at a way sometimes to comfort uh, in this specific case, you know, the, some of the, the women, the fact that, okay, I, I know that it's just for women in a way it's comforting, or I know I'm just going to perform for this, just this, this kind of audience, there is a comfort in there. And, and, and that's the expansion of looking at creativity that in this case, the restriction indeed, then we can think about it as a contradiction at first, but actually maybe it's not that. Uh, a contradiction. This is something that maybe I don't develop enough in the book, and that could be um, the ex I talk about it an expansion to look at um, creativity in a different way, um, and uh, and taking off the, the liberal point of view and integrating religion. So that, that would be my. And I think there is there's a lot of um, the, the literature in is you know in. Um, Writing about Muslim women and also in Christianity is much more than in Jewish studies. I think uh, there there's not that much uh, work that has been done on uh, the Orthodox world and the art because of that very strong distinction and because also maybe the the Jewish world Jewish artistic work is looking down on you know maybe cultural music is a place where maybe there's a sense of pride mm -hmm. uh, and and here the link between you know the synagogue and the and the opera. It wasn't like brought, but there is there is some tension here on how the, the in Jewish studies more specifically I think uh, we look at uh, the art coming from from this this uh, orthodox world. Yeah, I loved that part of the book where you lay out all these different kinds of creativity of ways of thinking about that. I think that's a real contribution. Uh, okay, so also kind of big picture. What kinds of social changes do you see these marginalized women artists actually making in terms of religious authority? And I, I see your work in conversation with a lot of um, other feminist uh, social scientists, religious studies, like I'm thinking in particular of Michelle Rauther, who talks about pregnant women's agency. They don't ask the rabbis, they don't, when they're pregnant, they don't ask the rabbis, they don't ask their husbands, they just do what they know that they know how to do. Um, so how do you use what kinds of social changes? It's it's um, I think going back to this idea of not ask it until that we come across for all the form, um, female artists except one who was the only one who is not married, which isn't that, that I write about in the book. So there is this this um, and I think. You know, this is also what you demonstrate in your in your book. I mean, this expansion art. Are we still? Where are we still listening to religious autonomy? You know, in the school, you know, all this this kind of space, and what you can do, what you're supposed to do in school, but all the things that are happening. You know, and, and here, uh, thinking about the, the expansion also of the art, how it is used for um, for wellness in some cases, uh, and in some of the going to these this big spaces where you don't need to just target them to, to so that's kind of um and the other aspect is um in terms of um i'm going to talk about voice and uh, and i stay i've looked at different reporting from the 90s of course since in the school in Montreal that I work with, and you see a certain change in their aesthetic and so and, and the projection of the 
factors. So um, the, the costumes, a lot of different elements that will potentially also have some impact on, on how they're going to dress. I mean, I think this is not really what I'm looking at. Already it's in the performance. So there is something that the imaginary they produce that, that has an impact directly on their, their um, you know, daily life or the way first, the way you will see also in, you know, in the studio in different places. So I think, um, yeah, in this case, I'd like to take the most political angle yes. when I'm talking about um, the voice and, and maybe also new type of you know, role models or, or jobs, opportunities. I think it's in the formal market, you have completely new opportunities also, um, you know, to make a pronouncement, to make a living. And the idea of permission. That you write about is really important. Very non problematic way if you stay in that private space. Yeah. And, you know, thinking about uh, in 2022 when I was actually writing, mm -hmm. it was the gathering of so many brothers saying, this is like women should get out of Instagram, you know, anti Instagram, as you find that. Like me in June 21st, something yeah. like this, and I was finishing the book, and I was, okay, who's gonna get out? <laughs> None of the women are even the chapter of this Wednesday, and also in the celebrity, they still don't. And they, some of them commented, and but it didn't really the corpus of. I, I talked also about the controversy. There's yes. a lot of uh, moments where we have backlash, and also that were almost cancelled. Um, you know, like maybe most of the things Yes, exactly. Uh, and uh, also another woman in Williamsburg as well that has been a lot of trouble as well. Um, but still, it's there. Definitely. So, uh, one more question. Uh, I know you've been in Tennessee probably, so yeah. um, another big part of the story that's in town um, has to do with artists who uh, become public figures outside of Orthodox. Um, including those who leave. And it's interesting because you talk a lot about the public perception of Orthodox women. And I think you know, the public is, is even more fascinated with women who leave yeah. than, than with, with Orthodox women themselves. So maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what you found in your photography in terms of who leaves, who doesn't leave, who occupies positions in between, and, and what can that tell us about the study of Jewish Orthodoxies? Generally. So the last chapter that is called the public performer is um, actually what I try to do with this chapter the two things. On one hand, the way also, uh, especially women, when they leave the community, how they perform, how they're presented, this very caricature, also the social stories, while it's much more complicated. Uh, so I took several, you know, two main um, figures. Um, that I take in, in, in the book um, and the story of Martha Goldman uh, and the production that she had with uh, Melissa Wise and their role in um, transforming the industry and transforming the market. Uh, and they're part of a building for a book of artists who are trying, you know, in the theater and also the film industry. And I think the film industry is even more um, because the, the theater is. is more the, the, the British theater. So the industry, and you've seen, you know, on Netflix and uh, all this traction to these kind of process. And what has been very important is to capture also the complexity of the industry, of navigating walls, and also, in some cases, also staying still inside and um, providing some changes also to girls who are still inside. And that's the story of the woman that I write about in the, in the book. So there is that. And the other part is the argument that when you talk about the representation of Jewishness in the media and all of this, and uh, this connection, like, doesn't matter if you're Hasidic, if you're Jewish, as long as you're Jewish. And I'm making the argument that there is a very difference, a very strong difference, I think, that the representation of Hasidic is not the same. You know, if you're a liberal Jew, you know anything about Hasidic, I think it's almost the same if you're Jewish. And maybe there's a public hour, but to, to think about Hasidic class, not to expand the category of Jewishness and to complexify also 
change of conditions in North American um, cinema. Yeah, it's been narrow. <laughs> I think that at that, there's a lot more to say, and I really encourage you to read the book, but we'll have Jessica yes. now take over and read a small sample. You can stay with me now.